Luke chapter 19, 1 through 10. If you have your Bibles or your cell phone or iPads, let's get, go right to the Scripture. Luke 19, verse 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Uh, the Bible tells us that he's a chief tax collector, and all that means is that he's just hated more. That's all that is. Because you have tax collectors, and then you have chief tax collector, and people really hated this guy. He's a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down when? Right now. Come down immediately. There's nothing to pray about. There's nothing to talk to anybody about. Come down right now. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Can I just, can I just park here for a moment and say some of, the, some of the meanest people on the planet are religious folks. Why are you play hating? Why are you hating? Some of the people are just haters. You know, that Jesus went into a sinner's house. If you see me down Division Street talking with people that don't look like you, don't talk like you, perhaps don't believe what you and I believe, don't start talking and say, praise God, Pastor Choco is ministering to them. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back how many times? That's important, y'all. That's important, y'all. Four times. So if I stole $100 from you, I'm going to give you $400. The Levitical law only requires that I give you a fifth, which means 20% of $100, which is $20. So if I stole 100, I'm going to give you back 100, your 100, plus the 20, which according to law, I'm in the right to do. He says, I'll pay you back four times. He supersedes the law. He goes above and beyond the law. Four times this amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. Because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to what? And what? Save the lost. He didn't come to establish a religion. He came to seek and save that which is lost. Repeat after me. Your word is written in my mind. Your word is hidden in my heart. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. I will seek you with all my strength. I choose to live my life according to your word. Your word, O oh Lord, is eternal. Amen. You may be seated. We are in the fourth week of the sermon series, Disgrace. When we do not properly honor the grace of God in our lives, we disgrace the kindness of God. And what we've learned about grace is that grace is unmerited, loving favor of God. I want to give you six things that we've learned in this last month of August about dissing grace. Number one, we learned that grace is a gift from God. If you're taking notes, that Grace is a gift from God that brings salvation. We are saved by grace. It is the Holy Spirit pulling on us, tugging at our hearts, His kindness and His mercy at work in us. It is because of grace that we are even able to come to God. Watch this. We 
cannot save ourselves. It is the grace of God. Ephesians 2 8 9 says this For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself, it is the gift of God, not by works. So that no one can boast. So we learn that grace is a gift from God. Number two, we learn in the month of August that God is all grace. That God will never run out of grace. That sin will never outdo grace. Come on, somebody. He will give you grace again because he is gracious, loving, and kind God. Can I get a witness here today? The Bible says in 1 Peter 5.10, and the, and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, the God of all grace, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. John 1, 16, out of his fullness, out of his fullness, we have received grace in the place of grace already given. In other words, I already gave you grace and in grace again. Romans 5, 20 says, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Number three, we learn in this month that grace offers us a choice. Since we have died to sin, we can choose to live free from sin. <laughs> one, one, one person said amen. Hey, listen, y'all. Sin is attractive. Sin is attractive. We, it's easy to live in sin. There's no work. Just follow your flesh. Do it. Right? That's what people say. That's what the market is. Just do it. Live and let live. And there are Christians who live with that model. There are Christians who live their lives this way. Just do whatever. It's your life. Grace offers us a choice for sure. But we have died to sin. We've died to that lifestyle. We've died to those choices that we used to do. Now we want to walk with the master. What should we say? Romans 6, 1 and 2 says this. What should we say then? Should we go on sinning so that the grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? In other words, if God took you out of Egypt, why does he want you to go back to Egypt? If God took you out of alcohol, why are you drinking alcohol? If God took you out of drugs, why... I'm trying to preach here today. I'm trying to preach a sermon. Why would you think that God took you out of that and that you can go right back to that? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. Romans 6.14 says this. For sin should no longer be your master. Because you're no under the law, but under the grace. You're no longer under the law, but you're under grace. I shared with you a few weeks ago about my, my daughter and her husband. They're two pit bulls. And how Cooper, when he was a baby and I was training him, and I would walk in Humble Park without a leash. And being without a leash is the law. He had no leash around him. That means he had no law around him. But Cooper would walk next to me, and when I would stop, he would stop. And I would say, sit down, he would sit down. Now, he had a choice. He could have gone out there and done whatever and run and, 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 you know, do whatever. But because he wants to please the master. He, live, he lives next to the master. You and I have seen people walk their dogs and it's crazy. And there's that lady and she's over there and come over here. And, come and the dog is dragging that owner. And you got to ask the question, what kind of relationship is that? Why doesn't the dog listen to the owner? She feeds him. She takes him a bath. She gives him water. She picks up after him. Why do you treat me this way? Somebody's got to get this today. Someone's got to get this today. You're no longer under the law. You no longer have a leash around you. You have grace. 
I haven't even started preaching. I'm still giving you an overview. My word. Woo, child. Woo. Glory to God. Walk with the master. Walk with him. You don't have the law around your neck. And four, we've learned this month that God's grace is God's power working in us. As we continue in Christ, grace works in us, empowers us. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. His power, my weakness, his power, my faith, we could do amazing things. Acts 4, 3, 3, with great power, the apostles continued testifying to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them, all of them. First, First Corinthians 15, 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I work harder. I work harder every day I wake up. Every day you wake up, you work harder to be next to the master. Every day you walk on this planet earth, you walk with the master and you fight against the flesh that wants you to live this crazy life. Whew. Number five, you learn that you can fall from grace. Many Christians like to believe that because God is all grace, that they can never fall away. Well, Scripture says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 and 15, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble. And defiled many. See to it that no one falls short, and that no root Listen, y'all, if you have a root in your life, a root of sin, a root of a behavior, get rid of it. Get rid of it because it would kill every nutrition, every word that's trying to come into your soil. It has nothing to do with the pastor. It has nothing to do with the preacher, the air conditioner in the building. It has everything to do that you have a sin in your heart. And has taken root. And is troubling you. We also learn in the month of August. Grace must be received. The principal illustration by the example of Noah. Who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah and his family were saved by preparing an ark. In obedience to God's instructions. God offered the grace. Noah by faith obeyed the Lord. He obeyed the Lord and as such was blessed by God. While God extends grace, humans, beings must be willing to receive the favor. 2 Corinthians 6 1, as God co workers, as God's co workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Listen, y'all, grace is a gift of God that deserves a right response. The right response of this dog, Cooper, is to stay next to me because he knows I feed him. He knows I give him water. He knows he wants to please me. God does not save us by grace so that we can live in disgrace. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Thank God I'm going to church. Thank God for the grace of God. And then you go back into your pool of blood. You go back into your sin. You go back into your vomit. That's not relationship. All right, now I'm going to start preaching. <laughs> Last week in the Gospel of Luke, we saw that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. We find that in Luke chapter 17, that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And he's going to Jerusalem because he's going to die. He's going to his death. And we found last week that he stopped by the village of Samaria in Galilee. And he healed the ten lepers. You remember that. If not, get the CD. He healed the ten lepers. Today, on his way to Jerusalem, he stops to the city of Jericho. Isn't it awesome that the God of grace has time to stop and heal people and touch people 
and eat with sinners. Number one, if you're taking notes, grace finds you. The Bible tells us that Zacchaeus was one of the chief tax collectors in the region of Jericho. And he was good at it. He was extorting money. Because the Bible tells us he was a wealthy man. That means that all the neighbors around Mr. Zacchaeus, everybody hated him. Jewish tax collectors like Zacchaeus were hated by their own people for several reasons. Number one, because they were cheaters. And number two, they were employed by the Roman Empire. And so the Jewish people saw these tax collectors as traitors. So they hated him. And they hated him more because he was a chief tax collector. But number one, grace finds Zacchaeus on a tree. Grace tugs at the heart of Zacchaeus. John 6, Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. Many of you are here today because the Father drew you today to come here. God tugged at your heart. You better go to church. I have a word for you. And he tugged at you last night. Go to church. Go to church. I have a word for you. Go to church. So he was tugging at your heart. You're not here by coincidence. You're here because God tugged at your heart. And this tugging was tugging at, at Zacchaeus' heart so much that he had to go see Jesus. And the scripture tells us he couldn't see Jesus because he was short of stature. He was short. He couldn't see him. But that wasn't going to stop him. He was going to get creative. And the tug that Zacchaeus felt inside was the grace of God drawing him to Jesus. What about the other people in the crowd? There's always people in the crowd who have no business. They have no purpose. They're there to gossip. They're there to just to see curiosity kill the cat. But there's other people that are here today that came with the purpose. And God, chances are that God wishes to draw others as well. But many probably were just there too busy. And they resisted. Zacchaeus, on the other hand, not only dropped what he was doing, but he went to great length to respond to this inner prompting of grace in his heart. So he tried to find a place where he can see Jesus. Zacchaeus had to go higher to see Jesus. He had to go higher. Sometimes in life you just have to go higher. Remove obstacles from you. There's always people in front of you and you just can't see. And so Zacchaeus had to go higher because he wanted to see Jesus. I don't know about you, but the more you go higher, the higher you go, there's less people up there. This is true. Even go in the ocean. The deeper you go, there's less people in the ocean. Everybody's in the shallow of the ocean. But you find very few people who want to go deep. Find somebody who wants to go deep. Hang around with people who want to go higher. Zacchaeus got higher. He got into this tree. I don't know how long it took him to get up on this tree, but he got up there. A man with wealth, a man with money, with prestige and power. But this grace was tugging at him. I want to see Jesus. And of all the people in the crowd, Jesus comes to the tree. And he says, Zacchaeus, Jesus never met him before, but he knew his name. Zacchaeus, come down immediately. Do this right now. Stop praying about it. Do it right now. I must stay at your house. Grace moved him out of the street, up on the tree. And offered to do lunch together was pure grace. You hear me? Now, hey, listen, y'all. Zacchaeus could have stood up there and said, muchacho, it took me like a half an hour to get up here. I'm not coming down. It took me 30 minutes to get up on this tree. And you want me to come down right now? Uh-uh. He could have done that. He had choices. Like you. You have choices. You can say, nope, I am ready to serve the Lord. Nope. Nope, I like being in the crowd. I like to go with culture. I like to, I like to go with, with what the flow is. I'm not ready to serve Jesus. This is my mother church. I just come with her. Mm. 
But he doesn't decline the offer. And God is not about to do a forced entry. The door must be open from the inside. You must open your heart from the inside. We must take the decision to yield to his mercy and receive the gift. And to receive the gift means that our hands must be empty. If I'm going to receive the gift of grace, then I must loose this hands. I must give back what I've stolen, things that I have said. Listen, y'all, it was a no-brainer for Zacchaeus. What he had to give up was nothing compared to what he was about to be receiving. Jesus walked with Zacchaeus. This is the grace of God. Walking with Zacchaeus. People talking. Look at Jesus. This guy's a cheap tax collector. He's a, he's a robber. And Jesus, I don't know what Jesus and Zacchaeus said during this journey of walking. But I do know that when Zacchaeus got to the house, he says, Hey, if I've cheated anybody... If I cheated anybody, I'm going to pay back four times what I took from them. That's grace. That's repentance. You and I know that repentance means you have to change. You were once this way, and now you come to Jesus Christ, and you change. And, you to you, and people see you and like, what is up with you? I expected you to curse. I expected you to go off on me. But what is that? Because you change. You don't live like that no more. Right? Because grace has come to your house. And when grace comes into your house, you don't react like you used to react. You don't talk like you used to talk. You don't walk like you used to walk. Right? Because Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. He tells you. Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus in the physical. But little did he know that Jesus was already working on his heart. He wanted to see Jesus physically while Jesus was working spiritually. The Bible says in Psalms 139, 1 and 4, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is in my tongue, Lord, you know me completely. Everything about you this morning, he knows you. He knows you better than your mama. He knows you better than your daddy. He knows you better than your husband, than your wife. He knows you. In that same psalm, he says, For you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in the secret place, I was woven together in the depths of the earth. You know me. You know me. Come down, Zacchaeus. And by the way, you should know that Zacchaeus means pure one. That's what his name means, pure one. And the Lord said, pure one, come down. He's like, I'm not pure. I'm a thief. I've stolen from widows. I've stolen money from people. Please don't call me pure. And the Lord said, pure one, come down. Papa, come down. Because he's not speaking to his present. He's speaking. I'm speaking to what you're going to become. I'm speaking to what you're going to become. Right now you feel like a thief. I got it. But I call you pure one. And I speak that into existence in your life. I speak into your existence those things that are not though they were. Pure one, come down. Oh, righteous one, come down. And he comes down, he said, please don't call me righteous. And the people are talking. He said, Lord, listen, listen, I hear these people talking. If I've stolen anything from anybody, I'll give back four times. I want to be right with you. I want to be right with my neighbors. Listen, if, if you took a dollar from somebody and you give back the dollar, 
you complied. I took a dollar, I gave you a dollar. But if I took a dollar from you, and I give you back the dollar, and then now I take you out to go get a steak, I really want to be well with you. I'm really repented that I took the dollar. The steak should say, all right, they're trying to make this thing work. If I just give you the dollar, here's your dollar. Well, there's nothing there. But if I go the extra mile and say, here's your dollar, and I just, here's, listen, I'm going to take you out to steak, you and your family, I'm going to treat you all. Now you know something's happened in my innermost being. Something happened in my heart. When I just gave you the dollar, that was just my wallet. But when I took you out for a steak, it had nothing to do with my wallet. It had everything to do with my heart. Amen. Does that make sense? And so what we're seeing in Luke chapter 19 is a man not dealing with only his wallet, but his heart. Because grace is in the house. Amen. And when Jesus, y'all, is in the house, you just don't stay the same. When Jesus is in your house and he's in your marriage, he's in the life of your children, things change. And Jesus saw this. I like, I like Luke chapter 18. In Luke chapter 18, you read the script. Read when you go home. In Luke chapter 18, you find, you find a, a rich man who comes to Jesus and said, hey, what's a, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, follow all the commandments. Follow all the commandments. And the rich man says, I've done all that. What else do I need? And Jesus says, you lack something. Give everything you have and give it to the poor. And then the Bible says, and the rich man went sad. And in that same chapter, you have a blind man on the road who's physically blind. And he wants to see. Helen Keller was asked, what is worse than being blind? She said, Having the capacity to see, but had no vision. And so he hears, he hears that Jesus is coming down that road, the blind man. And he says, Papa, I got to get his attention. I can't, where is he? Where is he at? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, right? I mean, he's blind. He just, he's like, have mercy. Mercy. He's asking grace to have mercy. I want to see. And so Jesus heard the guy who's screaming because he's the only guy in the entire church that's screaming. And then Jesus said, go get him. Bring him. Bring him. So the disciples went to go get the blind man and said, and they bring him to Jesus. And look at the question that Jesus asked him. What do you want me to do for you? Because, you know, some people are like, I, man, I'd love to have $1,000 right now. I don't know where you're at. Where you're blind. I'd like 1000 Give me a new car. And Jesus is like, Papa, you can't even see. You want a new car? I mean, because the question, the question is legit. The question is legit. I know what you need, but do you know what you need? What do you want me to do for you? Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said, I... I want to see. I don't care about a car. I don't care about the money. I don't care about anything else. I want to see. And Jesus said, your faith. Your faith. My power, but your faith. My power and your faith. We could do amazing things. That's in Luke chapter 18. In Luke chapter 19, you have another rich man. In the name of Zacchaeus. He's a rich guy, and he's blind, not physically, but he's blind spiritually. And he says, I want to see. I want to see Jesus. And you know the story. And Jesus comes, tell him to come down, let's go to your house. Boom, he goes to the house. And he says, I'll get back four times. And Jesus said, look at me. And Jesus says, today, salvation has come to this house. He could have said, he could have said salvation has come to you. But he says, everybody in the crib. That's a 70 terminology. Everybody in this crib is saved. 
Because one, one man, one woman had the audacity to have grace in their house. Now the Bible says in Luke chapter 18, is there anything impossible for God? Is there anything impossible for God? Because when you look at Luke chapter 19 and you find a wealthy man as the Zacchaeus climbing a sycamore tree, that's impossible for man. But for God, it's possible. Yeah. When grace tugs at you, is there anything impossible? Well, Luke chapter 19, Jesus is visiting a sinner's house. What's impossible for man is possible for God. Grace invites him. Grace forgives him. And says, today, salvation has come to your house. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that Jesus of Nazareth would say, I'm coming to your house today? Right? I mean, there are people like, if I would call to some of you, like, listen, I'm coming by your house today, okay? You'd be like, what time? What time? Right, because then at that point you're like, I gotta get the house clean. I gotta, but that, but that, but that. and people, oh no, come next week. I need time. I need time. And Jesus said, immediately, right now, I gotta get in your house. You need to have order in your house. You need to have grace in your house. You don't have time to make things right right now. Choose right now, this day, who you will serve. Can I preach here? Can I preach here? Yes. Choose who you're going to serve. But immediately, yeah. you don't have time to think about this thing. Because life is short, y'all. Life is short. But I tell you one thing, that he was never the same. He was never the same. Can you imagine that he's going to every neighbor and says, listen, I stole $1,000 from you for all the taxes for the last 10 years. And so... I'm going to give you 4000 The one who's receiving. Because I told you, grace is not only to receive, but to give. I got to give back. And the problem with many Americans is we're just so consumers. Give me, 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 give me. No, I'm trying to teach you here this morning. Give back. Give back. Grace forgives. Grace invites you. Jesus invites you. He knows everything about you. You hear me? Even your secrets. He knows them. Stand with me this afternoon for a moment. Watch this. Watch this. We are in a place today. That we must see the evidence of repentance. I shared with you that the Levitical law was required. If I took if I took a hundred dollars from you, the Levitical law says I must give you one fifth in addition to what I stole from you. This man says, I'm not gonna give you one fifth. One fifth is 20%. I'm gonna give you four times. I'm really gonna show you. That my life has changed. I'm not the same guy. And I'm not going to give it back to you like, toma. And here's the $20 too. No. No. I really believe that there was a genuine repentance in Zacchaeus. Because nobody prompted him. Grace was in his house. He heard the murmuring. He says, I'm guilty as charged. I know you called me pure. I know you called me righteous one. But I don't feel like that. But let's make things right here. I'm going to go above and beyond. So that my neighbors would know. That I'm really a changed man. That I'm really a changed woman. And that's what people will see in your life. It's not you carrying a Bible. Because the fact that you carry the Bible. Doesn't mean anything. Come on, come on. Let's just, let's just talk here. I mean... The fact that you and I carry a Bible doesn't mean anything. All right? It's like that going into McDonald's doesn't make you a Big Mac. No, you just went to McDonald's. But when I read the Bible, and what I read 
impacts me to be a better husband, father, pastor. God, teach me not to be only hearers of the word, but a doer of the word. That when people see me, when people see me down Division Street or in the city of Chicago, they would not see me with this leash. Like, oh, there's that Christian. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. That's a leash. That's a leash. That's law. I don't live under the law. I live under grace. But my grace is not a grace that I abuse. I stay next to the master. And yes, he gives me the freedom to run and do whatever. But then I'm displeasing the master. Because that's not what he taught me. Does that make sense? Repentance is genuine. Repentance should be clear. It should be evident in your life. Right? Because when you have a proximity to the Father, you change. Come on now. Go ahead. Stand next to your children. When you walk into the room, your kids are like, <laughs> Mommy's in the room. Papi's in the room. Right? Because there's a proximity. When your child is next to you, they're like, and there are people who know them when you're not around, they're like, me either. Let the father leave and see how this thing goes wild. My kids, your kids, my kids are a representation. My kids don't live with the leash. They live in grace because they want to please their father. To live right before God. And when you're next to the father, you have no other recourse but to change. Zacchaeus was next to the father. He was next to Jesus. Jesus was in his crib. In his house. I want to change. I want to change. And when you let him in, things change. You're not the same. You look younger, by the way. Yeah, sin will make you look like you're 30 years older. Yeah. It will suck the life out of you. Some of you are like 30, but when you're in sin and living that life, you're like 65. You look like, oh man, I thought you were 60. Yeah. I want to please the Father. Grace finds you. Grace invites you. And grace forgives you. And he forgives you today. But you must let him in. Does that make sense? There will be no leash on you. Go ahead. If you want to be wild, that's you. But it doesn't please the Father. Because when you were in sin, you were in sin. But you're no longer in sin. You're in the light. I want to pray for you.